Hi everybody, I've got another hand building project for you today and again it's going to use two different colors of clay. In this case it's going to be a dark clay and a light slip and we're going to create some patterns that just happen because of the process. It's not something where you have to know how to draw or paint or anything artistic like that. You can just learn this process and you can make something that looks really cool. So I'm going to start out by telling you all the things that you need to gather together to be ready to start this project. So I have red clay, I have white slip and a brush. A cheesy, crappy brush is just what you need. You don't want a nice brush. Uh, it's okay for there to be variation in the thickness of the slip when you apply it. The most special item you're going to need to get a hold of, and we have this in the studio in the cupboard with the um, stains, is some sodium silicate solution. Uh, and this is cut about 50% from how it comes when you buy it. You can also order a pint of this um, from a ceramic supply house. It's not expensive. Uh, it's used in making casting slip, um, but I love it for this process. Kohiki slip is a process where we're going to apply a slip to our, our base clay. We're going to stiffen a little bit with the torch, and we're going to apply this magical bug juice, sodium silicate, also known as water glass. Torch it again to set it. And then we're going to stretch that slab and I can't wait to show you. I'm really excited. Um, I do think that you need a torch. A heat gun would also work. And when you're using a torch, it's pretty important that you know what you're torching on. So I have a wonderful piece of backer board, um, cement backer board. Um, Mike Blackston made these for the studio and they're wonderful. They don't burn if you accidentally hit them with the torch. You definitely, definitely, definitely want to avoid using the torch against plastic, foam, um, the tables at the studio, the table in my studio. Uh, these things are not friends with fire. Um, you could use drywall or plywood. Just be really careful. The drywall, you will toast the paper if you get the torch on it, and you can scorch the, the plywood if you use plywood. So ideally cement backer board. Um, you could put it on a cement floor if you're working at home. Uh, you could put it on your garage floor and do it or out in your driveway. You're just going to pick up some texture and in my case probably lots of other things from what's already on the floor. So without further ado I'm going to change the camera angle and get going showing you the steps of the process. Okay let's get started making this project. I open down my bag of red clay. Looks like somebody stole a little bit off the side there. That's okay. I'm going to wire off three or four pounds because I want to make this a fairly substantial pot. You can do this at any scale that you want. So you could just make a one pounder to try it. Um, I've done it before. I know I like it. So I've got a pretty hefty chunk of clay here. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the rest of my clay. And I do want to prepare this clay um, so that it's nice and even. So I'm going to do a little bit of wedging here. Whenever I cut a slice off, I always beat it down into more of a cube shape to get it started. And then I'm going to just do a little ram's head wedging here. Ooh, maybe it's not going to feel so good on my wounded hand. I'll do the best that I can. If my left hand looks weird as I'm doing this, it's because I've got an enormous blister right in my palm. All right, that was fresh out of the bag stuff, so I don't have to go crazy, but I'm gonna pack this into a really nice, tight ball, and I'm gonna make it as round as I poss possibly can. I want this finished product to be quite organic, but I want it to be organic round, not organic cube or rectangle. So I'm gonna start out just by beating this thing into a nice ball, as if I was gonna put it on the wheel and throw with it but I'm not going to. All right, that's getting pretty nice and round. Doesn't have to be perfect, but I'll get it as good as I can. Okay, so a nice round ball. I'm gonna take this nice round ball and make it into a round disc. So I've got it smacked on the table, I'm gonna smack it on both sides just to get it started. So I've got less whomping to do. And then I'm gonna take the palm of my hand 
to the flattest part I can find and just work this out into a nice thick slab. We're not trying to make finished thickness right now. We're just trying to get this into more of a slab shape. Flip it over, working on the other side a little bit. All right, at this point, it's maybe an inch, inch and a half thick, and it is enough of a disc that I'm gonna be able to stretch it without it doing some kind of somersault when I put it on the table. So that's kind of the, the thickness we're looking at. And here's where we start to build the surface. Obviously from here, you could stretch this out and put it over a hump mold and you could make a bowl. Um, but let's do this extra Kohiki step and make it super cool. So I have some white slip here and a container that I can't open. Ooh, apparently there was some dried gunk down inside the lid of that and now it's all over my work surface and my slab so it's going to be extra organic but here goes nothing so i'm going to get the brush nicely loaded and i don't want to just be random with this i want there to be some underlying pattern to the way i apply the slip so i think i'm going to just brush stripes of slip on there So I'm gonna always go in the same direction. And I'm gonna put a few coats because I want this to be thoroughly coated. One more coat, I'm gonna try to catch the ends of the, the brush strokes there. Part of me is thinking those look really cool and I shouldn't do anything. Um, but another part of me just wants one more coat. Okay, so the stripes and the striations caused by my brush strokes are running in a uniform pattern. I need to move my slab to something that I can use the torch on. So I'm gonna carefully pick it up by its edge. Probably would have been smarter to move it before I put the slip on there, but that's all right. So it's on a concrete board. I'm gonna put it up on something not that the plastic isn't flammable, but it won't be getting hit by the torch. Um, so that I can torch it and not ruin my table. So, here we go. With this, you wanna keep your torch moving so that you don't over dry one particular area. And the purpose of this is to dry out that slip and the reason we're not just waiting for everything to get leather hard is we want to get the slip dried out without letting the, the bulk of that clay get dried out. All right, and that's looking good as far as getting the um, sodium silicate put on there. We just want that slip to sort of skin over and we're not trying to get it super super dry so i'm going to take my brush and get all of the slip that i can out of it no sense in wasting it and i'm gonna rinse that brush out in my little bucket down here get the excess water out of it so i don't dilute my um, sodium silicate and now I'm going to put the sodium silicate on the piece now a word about sodium silicate it is the material that is used to turn moist clay into casting slip what does that mean it will take clay that has this same moisture content and make it fluid and so it's really cool but you don't want to recycle things that have this on there we don't want to cause the reclaim 
to turn into a liquid. So we just want to, if you have scraps or you have screw ups with this, I think that's one situation where we just throw it in the trash can and don't try to recycle it. We don't want to contaminate a huge quantity of recycled clay, just trying to save a little bit. So I've got my brush loaded pretty adequately with this sodium silicate. And I'm just gonna to try to lay it on this top surface. I wanna keep it slightly away from the edge. I want the edge to maintain its integrity when I stretch and I don't want it to get all sort of crackled. So I'm gonna just lay this on here and try to get it on as evenly as possible. And I'm gonna take one little pass around the perimeter so I kind of have a nice even edge. I'm trying not to get it down around the edge onto the plain red clay. So I want that clay to just stay intact. If you have a light overhead, you can kind of get where the light is showing and that'll um, in the reflection of the sodium silicate and that is gonna give you an idea of whether it's all been wet with that chemical. Looks like I missed one little spot. All right, so to me that looks like it's right on schedule. Let's go ahead and use the torch again. And now we're going to make it get dry and set that sodium silicate surface. I'm still using the light and the reflection from the light to tell me when I've got this surface dried up enough. We're almost there. I've just still got a few little wet patches. Just have to keep it moving. All right. Now we're starting to feel pretty set up. And I actually have a few little areas that are already getting a little crackly. Don't worry about that discoloration, nothing's burning. It's just something that happens and it'll just look white when it goes um, through the kiln. So that's great. We've got a surface here that is dry to the touch. It is not recommended to throw your propane torch on the floor. So we're ready to do the, the kind of exciting reveal at this point on this process. So I'm gonna just scoot my clay back out of the way and make a little space here. To stretch the slab. Now, if you are not adept at stretching slabs on the table by the method that I'm about to demonstrate, practice on it um, with some unadorned clay to begin with until you feel really comfortable stretching a slab this way. It's a useful skill for any hand builder to have. So I'm going to carefully pick up my slab by its edge and, and I'm going to support it and I want to, I guess the right word would be sort of skid it down onto the table. And so I'm going to come from away from me toward myself. And you can maybe already see the beginnings of some crackles opening up. I'm gonna turn it around, but obviously because I'm making a decorated surface on the top here, I don't want to flip it the other way around. I wanna always leave the white side up. And I'm gonna keep stretching it in all four cardinal directions. Now, I think you can see the pattern is really starting to open up and it's showing evidence of the original brush stroke direction, uh, which I love. I think that's one of the coolest things about this Kohiki slip technique. Now I just need to stretch this slab out 
until it's an appropriate thickness for the size of bowl that I want to make. And I am not planning to trim the edges. I'm going to leave this red, red clay edge showing as kind of a border. Um, looking at it, clearly I drizzled sodium silicate down the side because it's cracking too. But um, I think that's from the torch drawing the, or, or sort of blowing the sodium silicate solution over the edge. But this is starting to look really cool. All right, so that is getting to the point where I feel like it's an appropriate thickness to go over a slump mold and make a nice, interesting bowl that wouldn't be your typical um, typical bowl that you would see every day from a, a hand builder. Um, it's got this really wild, intricate surface. It's got this nice organic edge. It's kind of already finished. It doesn't need um, a coil or anything like that. And so now it's uh, decision time. If I want the pattern to be on the inside of the bowl, I can do that. And I would need to glaze over it so that it was nice and functional. Um, if I want the pattern on the outside of the bowl, I don't have to glaze it. I can just glaze the inside of the bowl and leave the outside completely bare. And I think in some cases, when you have a really interesting slip texture like this, it's almost cooler just to leave it bare um, and have it be completely just that without anything over the top of it. Um, I have a super jumbo king size hump mold. And I think when you're hand building over a hump mold, you get the best results when your slab doesn't reach all the way down to the bottom of the mold. Um, you gotta balance it. If you want a certain amount of curve, you need to make sure that it's um, small enough that you're gonna get some curve and it's just not gonna be sitting up on the top. So for a, a little cereal bowl size bowl, this slump mold would be useless. But I think for this, it's gonna be pretty cool. And I'm definitely opting for the texture on the outside. So I'm gonna carefully lift this slab. I'm gonna kind of bump my mold up here under the camera. And I'm gonna gently, gently, gently drape this down and I wanna get it carefully on center. So I'm kind of using my eyes and my hands to feel for where I'm balanced over the middle of that mold. I can probably adjust it a little bit, but the closer I get to the middle when I start, the better. And I think that that is going to acquire enough curvature that it's going to look pretty cool. So now I need to, with really flat hands, bring this down to the shape of the mold. Now I have torched this, so it's a little stiff and it feels a little crusty on the top. So I'm gonna really take my time and spread my hands out. I don't wanna take one part down too soon. I wanna just work it a little at a time all the way around the form. It's helpful sometimes to turn it. If you have a big enough Lazy Susan for your mold, that's a great thing to have. And here it goes. And that edge that was the original edge of the disc of clay that I started with makes a really cool edge to this bowl. It's um, it's almost not fair how cool that looks. And again, no special art training was required. Just this cool process that you now know. Obviously, you don't have to make it completely contact the mold. That just is a way to ensure that the inside is a little bit more round, a little bit more functional, and the outside can be super funky and cool like this. All right. So let's kind of call that good, and I'm going to take the camera off of the tripod and get you a little close up of this. Um, before I do, I just want to talk about this surface. Obviously, if this bowl just ends here, um, it's going to be tricky for it to sit nicely on the table because this dome 
you know, it's just a dome. It's going to rock around if you put it on the table. So you have options. You could add a foot ring. The trick is when you're adding a foot ring, it's going to be just solid red clay and it might not completely um, look right. So you might be better off um, just tapping the bottom of it on a board and getting it to get flat um, and just have a flat bottom instead of trying to elevate it up onto a foot ring. Um, if you do want to add a foot ring, I would definitely form the ring as you want it to be completely done and just carefully, carefully slip and score and just attach it. Don't do a lot of smearing in or, or joining, just sort of stick it on there because uh, you don't want to obscure or blemish this beautiful pattern. All right, let's get you a close up of what we ended up with and then we'll talk about um, how to get it off the mold. Okay, so here is the finished texture from that Kohiki slip process. When you look at it from above, you can really see the original brush stroke direction, which I absolutely adore. And the variations in thickness of application of the sodium silicate leads to some areas where the cracks go deeper and some where they're just shallower, skin deep. And then what I really love more than anything is this super cool edge that forms around the side of the slab. And you can see where I ran a little bit of slip over it in my original uh, slip application, but that edge is super cool. And this is an area where the sodium silicate lopped over the edge. So that probably makes the rim of the bowl a little bit less durable, um, but it sure looks cool. So I'm going to put the camera back on the tripod and show you the final step, which is turning it back right side up and removing the mold. All right. So this um, bowl is basically done. It just needs to get turned over onto a board. You want to wait until it's stiff enough that it's going to hold its shape. But when you're doing something over the outside of a mold, it's important not to wait too long. Uh, you can't go away and leave it uncovered overnight because the clay still needs to shrink. The bisque bowl is fired, so it's not gonna do any shrinking. And what you'll have is some split going from the rim inward as it tries to shrink and it can't. So getting them off the mold, maybe before you're really comfortable is fairly important. Uh, I don't wanna drag this bottom around on something. So I'm gonna use this nice smooth board and I'm gonna place it on the center, and I'm not gonna worry so much about um, tapping it down or anything like that. I'm just going to place it on there, carefully lift up my bowl mold, which weighs a ton, but hopefully we can get it flipped over for the camera here, and we're gonna turn it right side up. And then I'm gonna use my chest to help lift that bowl mold out of there. Now, it's on the board now and because I transferred it when it was fairly wet still um, it's already taking the shape of the board in other words the bottom is flat so the inside has just the texture of canvas the outside has got the cool Kohiki texture and you can see it's sitting flat to the board at this point from here you can just dry your bowl the rest of the way to leather hard so that you can pick it up and sign your name on the bottom um, and then put it back and get it bisque fired and figure out exactly how you're going to hold on to it to glaze. So the downside of a slab built bowl that doesn't have a foot is you're stuck. You've got nothing to hold on to, um, but I'm sure I'll figure out a way to get some glaze on the interior of this and I hope you really enjoyed seeing this process and I hope you feel empowered to use it in your own work. Obviously you're not limited to a slab over a mold. Uh, you could form a sheet of that material and slab build with it to make anything. You could fo fold it up and make a mug or a tumbler. You could build a box with pieces of Kohiki's textured uh, slab. Heck, you could even build a an architectural model out of it. Anything that you want to do with slabs, uh, you can certainly do with a Kohiki textured slab. 
and it'll just look that much cooler. So thanks so much for watching the video. Um, hopefully my directions were pretty clear. Definitely remember not to recycle clay that has been contaminated with sodium silicate. Just let it go. Uh, you're better off just tossing it in the trash can. It's not that it's toxic, it's just that it might deflocculate the entire recycle barrel and that would be a huge waste in trying to save a little scrap of clay. Um, have fun and leave me some questions if you are unclear about how it all works. Thanks.